Megan O'Russell. Russell. <laughs> Megan O'Russell. Russell. Thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. I'm your host, Matthew Whiteside, as always, coming to you live from Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> What's up? How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing great. Great. I was bringing some energy this morning or this afternoon. I don't even know what time it is. I'm so excited to talk to you. You've got some amazing things <laughs> going on. First off, you are a writer of books, an author, as they call it, correct? Yep. Yeah. I am an author. And the book you have, the book you have written, Girl of Glass, this is a book that is out now, correct? Yeah, it is out now in ebook, and tomorrow it should be out in paperback, too. Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah. Will this, will this be the first time you see your book in paperback or um, physical form? It will be the first time that it'll be in physical form that I've had control of. So I got to pick the cover design and do all those fancy things. So it's super exciting. That is exciting. So let's let's dig into this a little bit. I'm I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, the story that we talked a little bit about before we started recording. All right, Girl of Glass. What is this story about? It is a why a mid apocalyptic sci-fi that happens to have chemically induced vampires. So there's a bit of a genre blend. Yes, <laughs> I like it. Mostly dystopian. Yeah, that's pretty neat. So chemically induced, so these are like genetically enhanced humans that are take on characteristics of vampires. Yeah. Correct? So as the world is decaying and things are going horribly, humans have found a way to alter themselves to survive. And they become vampires. Ooh. But there is no, like, bury them in a grave and, like, snuggle for the night to become vampires. Like, that, that doesn't happen. It's a, is it a nasty process? Um, it's, it's pretty painful. It's not a great process. There's just not cuddling involved. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, painful, like, injections to the heart kind of thing. Giant yeah. needles, <laughs> lots of pain, but no, like, this, like so. This is a horror, then a horror book. It's a terrifying. Uh, needles are the scariest thing known to man. <laughs> then it is definitely a horror for you. <laughs> but no, it's not. It's not particularly violent. It's not horribly gruesome. If you don't like blood at all, probably not your best bet. But there, it's not like Game of Thrones where there's going to be like nasty stuff everywhere. Well, I'm cool with Game of Thrones, so I, I'll be fine with this. I, and I, I feel like reading about blood is okay. It's <laughs> like, definitely worth seeing it. You should put like you should put like blood packets in the book, so when <laughs> you open the page that has blood on it, that's never been done. That's you can use that if you want. That'd be cool. Just spray blood. <laughs> just it spray ends blood. up in Barnes and Noble, and the YA section is just covered in blood. <laughs> That's Megan's fault. That Megan O. Russell. Hey, yeah. your name, your name. That's how you get your name out there. You got to be different, you know. Yeah. That, sounds, that sounds really cool. Um, so how? All right. How far in the future are we talking? And you said like mid-apocalyptic. So this is like right in the middle of the world falling to pieces. Yeah. We're joined. Like, do we join a character? Is it one character or multiple? It's we join one character. It's. I'm not really deciding how far in the future it is. Basically, 90% of the technology you see, we have now. Okay. So they're still using cars. They're still, like, using flashlights, all of those things. It's seen from the point of view of one of the people who have been chosen to survive. So mm -hmm. as the world has ended, the elite have created basically biodomes for themselves. So they've built it, they built these glass castles basically, where yeah. they can swim and they have clean air and there's no disease. And so they oh. live behind the glass to protect themselves from the pollution and contaminants that have killed the world. Okay. And so the story is told from the point of view of a girl who was born in the domes. Mm -hmm. 
And they don't really explain to their children, by the way, people are starving and dying on the outside. Like, this is the reality of everyone is going to go extinct outside of our glass walls. And so when she realizes what's going on and starts seeing that there are actual human beings who are suffering and dying, that's yeah. when she becomes involved in the story with what is my obligation as a compassionate human to help those who are suffering? And it sort of dives in from there. And, wow, then, so there's, and then there's vampires. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they fit in there nicely. I, I, I'll, I'll trust you on this, that you're not just like throwing vampires at the, these glass biodomes. Is, <laughs> is, uh, so it's, it's obviously like a coming of, coming of age story, right? set in a utopian world inside these glass domes then i mean it's kind of like a utopia almost because is that right or? i mean she's very briefly in the domes most of the story happens beyond the glass especially when you get later in the series but she is from the utopia of the domes okay can i uh, is it giving it away what hap what happens to create this apocalypse is that a is that a Crust no, story. No, it's not. It's not even a massive big bang. It, and that's one of the the comments I've gotten most on the series is that it's such a realistic end to the world. Those are the best. I find it kind of disturbing. It's mostly that the pollution in the air became so bad that it started killing people. There was a shortage of fresh water, so it started killing people. There wasn't enough food to go around, so it started killing people. There was disease that was rampant because of the pollution people were living in. So it started declining the birth rates. And the people in the domes got scared and realized that having a healthy next generation of children was something that might not be attainable. So they locked themselves away to make sure that humans would continue. So there is no like massive war, no one giant event. It's just the slow degradation of the world to the point that it's not really livable anymore. Wow, that's. I mean, I love the 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 aspect where it's tied into such like you believable things, um, because when it's just way too far out there, you're like, well, you know, it, it takes you too far off the reservation. But when it's when it feels like it could really happen, you almost start reading the book like a how to. Like, okay, if, if it does, if this stuff does happen, how how are these biodomes getting made? Like, <laughs> like what's what's built? Yeah. It's what. Because I'm gonna need to build one. I'm gonna exactly. live in the glass. Exactly, and I have a bad taste in my mouth about biodomes from the movie Biodome with Polly Shore. I don't know if you remember this movie. I don't think I've seen it. It's a classic. It's <laughs> have to check it out. Some for somebody who writes about biodomes, you're gonna want to watch this movie. <laughs> it's not the best. Let me just tell you it, Polly Shore, but. Anyway, so this is book one of how many books? Four. It's a four book series. Four book series. Okay, and you've already have you already written all four books? Yep, and the last one is coming out in May. So they're holy cow! Yeah. Yeah. So this one dropped what like uh, the January? Think, yeah, no, um, last Thursday, so like February twenty first, something like that. Holy crap! Yeah. So you're you're gonna be you're you're gonna do one each month. Yeah, I yup. Yeah, it's yup. Yeah. You're gonna be busy. <laughs> yeah. I mean the nice thing is like most of most of the work, like the editing is done, all of those things are done. So it's just a lot of like formatting and metadata and all those things. All the yeah. fun stuff. Yeah, formatting is the worst. Are you, and you're using, uh, are you, you're going through um, KDP, right? Yeah, I'm doing KDP. I also bought Vellum. I also have a husband who's super tech savvy, so I, I kind of shoved it onto his plate. <laughs> Sorry about that, brother. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I I'm sure like, he doesn't mind. He, I'm sure he doesn't. No, it, as soon as I was, as soon as I bought Vellum, he was like, oh, this is, this is fine. That, no worries. 
So, <laughs> that one saved my marriage. Oh, that's great. Good job, so it's got, it's got to be something, right? That's fantastic. So, four books in four months are going to be published, but this isn't, you've actually written a ton of books. You've written 13 books. Why? Yeah. Why stop at this mythically scary number of 13? Um, Why not write? (laughs) There are more books that are in my agent's possession or that I've backburnered for now, but those are the ones that I have control over and are ready for the world. And I just happen to be that number, so... I feel like I've I've had my run of bad luck, so I'm just gonna go with it and accept it. Yeah. And hope, knock on wood, I've like run the the bad juju course. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute because you've written multiple books. First off, how long have you been writing for? Seriously, writing about five years. Okay, and Casually. in this five. Sorry, what'd you say? Oh, casually writing, I was like three years before that, but. Seriously, like every day, this is something I do. Five years. And was it within the five years that all these books were produced, or was it? Yeah. Okay, that's incredible. That's a. Uh, you must have really been hammering the keys every day. Yeah, I. Yeah, I. I like writing. It makes me happier to have a new project to be working on. So. I enjoy it. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> it's all, it's great. Um, so with what happened, you you uh, after you wrote all these books in five years, did you start looking for a publisher, or how, what was your process? Um, I actually got my first publisher about five years ago. Okay. Uh, for the tethering series and that one in the giant 2019 rollout will be about august i believe um i started submitting that project i was given a contract by a publisher pretty quickly in the process and between when i had the phone call with them where we discussed everything and when they put my contract in the mail and i received it three days later they had shut down within those three days Oh, no. (laughs) That was an interesting welcome to the publishing world. Yeah. Uh, So I went back out with that same book, The Tethering Again. Uh Uh-huh. Another contract pretty darn quickly, like within eight weeks or so. Were you querying people? I mean, did you, you went about, you got an agent first or? No, I was querying them myself. I, Hmm. yeah, I was. Looking into, I mean, if you're querying without an agent, you're really going to be looking mostly into small presses just because they're the ones who will actually open your query letters. Right. Um, So I got another contract and I was with them for about a year and a half, all the way through the editing process, cover art design, all those shenanigans. And then six weeks before the book was supposed to come out, they went kaboom. Oh my God. Um, yeah. So, and luckily I was on Facebook when I started hearing people chattering. So I was one of the first authors to like send in the letter of like, can I have my files back and where's my reversion? Of- <laughs> I need my stuff back, please. <laughs> I got that within like six hours. Some people, it took them two years to get their things back. Oh my and God. luckily because the book had never been published, they didn't owe me money. Um, for some of the other authors who had had their books out, the FBI ended up getting involved because oh the, the person who was running the company wasn't an actual person. It was an alias. So they had been like filing people's 1099s under this alias for this secret identity that they were stealing all the author's rights and royalties under. And it got bad, but that would, I... That would make a great book, by the way. That's a great story. <laughs> it would make a great book. And... The authors themselves were trying to figure out, like, who this person really was because they were convinced it was someone who was also an author with the publisher. And Oh, my gosh. Insane. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds nuts. But I got out of that one pretty scot-free. So that That's was, lucky. That's lucky. That's, yeah. 
happened at the perfect time for me. Yeah. You must so, have felt pretty pretty down on yourself though after two times. Like you must have been like, "Well, son of a gun, <laughs> like what the heck is going on?" I texted my mother and I was like, "Well, my book's not coming out in six weeks anymore." And her response was, "Well, this is a catastrophe." Thanks. <laughs> I Thanks, really Mom. needed you to clarify. Really... <laughs> like, there was a another girl with that publisher, and she was like, "We had been talking about joint promoing for our books because they were coming out a couple weeks apart, and they were both YA." And she said, "Well, I've already gotten in in with this other publisher. I'll uh -huh. put you on the phone with them." Well, I get a phone call from this other publisher, and they wanted to sign the book. And they were happy with the cover, so I could like keep all of that. And they would just buy the artist out to have the cover kept. Cool. <laughs> Go over to this publisher. Oh my god. And I was with them for about a year, and they published the first two books in the Tethering series. Oh wow. And I did some anthology work for them, and everything was going well until I sent them book three, and they said, "Well." We really don't feel like publishing anymore. We're going to take some time off. We need a vacation. <laughs> what? <laughs> you, you're a publisher. It's what you do. What? So I left them. Yeah. And I jumped out of there. Uh, then I ended up with a publisher for the Girl of Glass series. And everything was going really well with that. And Girl of Glass went through... First set of edits, the second set of edits, book one got published, the second book, Boy of Blood, got published, they published one of my novellas, and then in December, I had been trying to get a hold of people about publishing book three. Book three is apparently where I break the publishers. They're like, never mind, we can't handle you anymore, we just quit the business. So You're I, making these publishers give up completely. I am breaking the publishing industry. It's my fault. Make no Russell's fault. Yeah. So, and I signed with my agent about a year and a half ago. So he had been involved in contract negotiations. And I signed the first Girl of Glass book without him. But he had been involved in contract negotiations and, like, payments and blah, blah, blah. So I emailed him and I was like, hmm. This publisher is kind of ghosting me at the moment. Can you reach out and figure out where my edits are for book three and Girl of Glass? And 12 hours later, the entire author group gets an email saying, by the way, we're closing. Oops. I broke that one to him. Oh, my God. Yeah. And in the meantime, I had, with my agent, signed two other book series, three other book series, because the tethering got re-signed. And so did The Tale of Bryant Adams and The Chronicles of Maggie Trent. So I had three book series with another publisher, and things were going really well. They had huge amounts of authors. They had some books in Barnes & Noble, like, seemed super sturdy. Yeah. And then end of December, beginning of January, it's like someone set off a bomb. And it was just this huge chain reaction. And so... It was one of those, I could have stayed with them, but I think they only have two authors left out of the hundreds of us at this point. So yeah. I had a heart to heart with my agent and he basically said, you've been through too much and these books are tainted. <laughs> no oh, one is wow. to take them because <laughs> there is like, yeah, they, they are, Come they on. are ever tainted by the small press drama. So you can scrap them, you can try and stay with this constantly imploding press, or if you think you can do it on your own, you can self-publish them. I give you my blessing, because no one else is going to touch them. So, it took wow. a long heart. Like, yeah. none of that's fault, obviously. And and it's not like you were the only author on board with these places. And it's like these publishers obviously had some issues. <laughs> yes, they did. I think it's because the if you Google, if you really dive deep into any of those series, they're going to be 
you're going to be able to click through to the drama that happened with the publishers. Not with me specifically. I don't, I don't post in like those weird boards where everyone's like mad at their publishers. I don't, I don't do any of that because it can always be traced back to you. And I don't want that on my head as much as they say it's anonymous. Nothing's ever really anonymous. Um, but my publisher's names are all in there. And Mm -hmm. it would be very hard to create a press tour for one of the big publishing houses without having to go back to that. And so that's a big detriment to the books. Wow. But who cares if you're an indie? If you're doing it yourself and they click through to this crazy publishing drama with the FBI, no one's like, bad indie author. We can't have that on the press sheet. No, No, that's great. That's publicity. That's good stuff. You want to get that out there. (laughs) <laughs> that's like whoa this lady has must have written some crazy stuff man <laughs> we gotta read these books because i just keep breaking the small presses but you've been hired you've been hired by like random house to and penguin to go into the small press and destroy them one <laughs> one small press at a time honestly i've had some authors like email me and be like are you signed with any of these publishing houses because i don't want to sign with them if you're with oh. them because they're going to shut. All right. So how the the pool is going to start on how long Amazon has left in the publishing. <laughs> Before we break KDP. Before KDP falls apart. Which could happen. I could I could implode all of KDP. That's oh my god. Megan, if that happens, you have incredible superpowers. You should start your own publishing company. I have a I have a podcast called This Won't Work. You could you could use that for your publishing company called <laughs> just go, This Isn't Gonna Work. <laughs> Anything I touch, it's gonna die. Yeah, it's like the reverse Midas touch. Oh, yep. Man. I will destroy your publishing company. That's right. But these books are obviously they've gotta have some quality to them. They're they're not I mean, it's not like they're bad books. You've had so many publishers like them and invest in you. That it says it says it speaks to your work, obviously, okay. right? I, I mean, mean I, you would, I mean, just putting like just using common sense, it, it would speak to anybody's work that you're able to get publishers to invest in you when so many people have such a hard time finding a publisher. I mean, it was always very positive at the beginning, and if you look at I mean, I queried a lot in those five years. Like, there was a lot of rejection. Getting my agent, there was a lot of rejection. But I was just very determined about it and very excited. And I got to work with some amazing editors. Honestly, I'm not that mad about the last five years of disaster. Because if I had tried to start self-publishing five years ago, I, I would not have been able to figure out how to get a book up on KDP within, you know, six weeks of getting the rights back. There's no way. It wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have had the contacts to, like, find a good cover artist. I wouldn't have had the knowledge of how blurbs work, how categories work. I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to do this process successfully. So how was, do blurbs and categories work? Because I have no clue. <laughs> how, did, how did you go about finding that out? Because I'm trying to figure out how the hell to do that for my books. Honestly, I went, it's kind of cheating, but I went into my categories for the blurbs and I went to the top 10 free books in my category and the top 10 paid books in my category. I copied out all their blurbs into a Word document. I studied what I liked about them, what I didn't like about them, what caught my eye about them, what didn't catch my eye about them, to know what readers were really looking for in the genre. Mm -hmm. And then I worked my blurbs around what I liked about what those most successful authors had done. That's, That's, I mean, it's literally like a super simple answer, but it doesn't seem simple when you're trying to figure out, like, how the hell am I supposed to write a blurb? But that's genius. Well, because those are the people who, I mean, at least in the paid category, they have teams helping them write their blurbs. And obviously, you don't want to you don't want to steal their blurb. But if you yeah, find don't copy and paste. <laughs> like, 
don't be copy paste press. Don't do that. But if you if you find that like the top five sellers in your category have bulleted lists of like one elf, one dragon, like those sorts of things, that's what everyone is doing for the top five. You need to have a bullet list. At the top five in your category, because I write YA, all mention their age within the first two sentences. Mention your character's age within the first two sentences, because that's clearly what's catching the reader's eye. Yeah. So are they all ending with a question? Do they not have any questions? And then. That's uh, yeah, that's I got to do that. Thank you. That's a great tip. I'm sure I'm sure I'm honest to God. I swear that's like a really, really good tip because that like blows my mind that I didn't. I'm like, I, I hate myself for not thinking of that because it's so simple. And it, I think it's more laziness. I'm just going <laughs> to maybe it's lazy. Maybe well, I just didn't I think of it. But it's like it just takes research, right? Like you're researching the other people in your field. Well, and it seems like it would be really hard to do. But the way Amazon lays out their categories for everything, yeah. all you have to do, like, Girl of Glass is a YA dystopian. So Hunger Games, Maze Runner, like, those kinds of things are going to be at the top of that category. So just go in, see which categories they're in that you fit, click on it on their page on Amazon, and it'll take you to the top 100 in that category. Yeah. Like, Amazon lays it out for you so it's actually way easier than you think it would be just because of the way that amazon ranks their books yeah that's and i hey speaking of which by the way congratulations i saw yours is ranked number two in your category yeah i retweeted that joint that's amazing that's so awesome it's yeah i tried to have a sneaky launch for it because in with my traditional publishers it always seemed like launch day the wrong file was up or it didn't go up until you know late at night or this or that or like there was always something weird with launch day so I thought that's just how Amazon works yeah system did that so I tried to launch it five days early so I would have problems like time to fix any problems before anyone found it because <laughs> today was supposed to be launch day yeah I had really shared the link or like set up my newsletters or anything to go out but people found it anyway so that's great uh and luckily the files were right and yeah if you enter a pre-order with amazon it just goes up there is no delay there is no weirdness so i don't know what my publishers were doing i think they forgot to print the file yeah that's i mean it's i do you, do you think there's any because i just thought about this like Amazon, their algorithm or whatever, because getting your book out there can be tough. But there's this, there's these, these theories. Sorry, that if you write twenty books, you'll be making fifty thousand. Like if you publish twenty books, self-published, you'll be making at least fifty thousand dollars a year as a writer, as an author. Now this has all been written about, and there's like groups that promote this kind of stuff. Do you think it's because simply that the algorithm in Amazon sees your name so many times? with the different books and sales behind it, that eventually your name, they start promoting your name more so than the actual work. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think... Because nobody knows Matt White. <laughs> nobody knows me. But you've been in the publishing world for a long time. You've been published, I mean, five years at least, but you've been out, your name's been out there, and it's been involved in FBI scandals and whatnot. So it's like... Yeah. Perhaps. <laughs> I I think it's that, I think it's also, so the the theory that I've heard, and it's all conspiracy theories with Amazon. No one actually knows how it works. Like, nope. I feel like the FBI scandal is going to be like indie authors kidnapping Amazon agents to find out how <laughs> it works. That's going to be what the FBI investigates. That's right. But I've always heard about like the 30, 60, 90 rule where like Amazon treats you like a queen for the first, first 30 days after release. And then it's like the not so pretty princess for 60 days. And then it's like the steward for 90 days. And then they're like, go away, peasant. We don't care about you anymore. Yeah. So if you have 20 books out, you're probably releasing within the 90 days. So you're keeping your quasi royal status in the algorithms. And so you're always 
hanging above people who haven't released in a while. Right. Because I found at one point I had two books coming out from two different publishers within 90 days of each other. It's just how their schedules landed. I don't, I don't know. It was what editors were available. Um, and both books went much better because they were living off of each other's newness. And so I think that might also have something to do with it. But I think maybe Amazon also just always likes the new game because I had a hundred downloads in a day and I didn't share it. I don't know how people found it. I don't know how people found it. I You had a hundred downloads in a day on like when you first published, like the, the first day or Yeah. And I didn't I reached number six in my category before I had actually shared the link because I was going to wait till today. And then I was like, well, I, I mean, I want to share the picture of me at number six in case I don't get any higher. So then I shared the link with that. But I didn't actually start sharing. I moved my newsletter up to yesterday. I sent out the first like little tiny chunk of my newsletter telling people who subscribe to it that I have a new book and they, they should get it. But I don't. I don't know how people found it other than Amazon must have pinged it up higher on the list. I don't know how else they would have seen it. That's so cool. Well, congratulations on that because that's freaking awesome for you. Congratulate. That's really, really cool. I mean, I want every author to be able to sell a ton of books and a hundred in the first day is amazing. It's gotta be, it's gotta be a great feeling, right? I mean, to like, I mean, it's, it's a form of validation. I mean, people at least have bought it. Now it's, have you started getting review? Well, it's only been what four days. Yeah, I, I haven't gotten any new reviews yet, but my currently reading on Goodreads has gone up a little bit. Oh, Not good. enough like that. It's gone up like four people. Yeah. So, and then <laughs> Goodreads. But yeah, it's it's very cool. So you're basically you're doing the you're doing what we're talking about though, like with publishing a book within, like I was just saying, the twenty books to make fifty thousand dollars a year kind of deal you're doing you're like you're on that page in that wavelength then i suppose right yeah i mean i never intended to release this many books in a year i kind of had a minor meltdown when i realized i was going to go from four series under contract to no series under contract in like two and a half weeks that yeah. was not a great day for yeah. me there was a lot of wine a lot of, but, <laughs> um, but then I sort of realized that I have all of this product and I've always hated the fact that with the tethering series, so the, it came out the first time basically five years ago and then book two came out and then that publisher went away and I have some little stores who are refusing to carry my books anymore until book three and the tethering comes out because people are still going in looking for book three in that series and they're mad that it's not there. Mm. So when I finally re-signed it to its fourth publisher and they said that the last book in the series will come out till 2025. What? But it's just because of their publishing model that's when they can do it. And I realized I don't need to use that publishing model I have the books, they're edited. I just have to do covers and metadata and formatting and I can put them out there and I don't have to make people wait anymore. I don't have to get angry phone calls and emails <laughs> from shops because people are still asking for that third freaking book five years later. So I just decided to roll it all out at once and they're just gonna be there. and. People won't have to ask for book three anymore. It's going to be available. That's awesome. And I'm really lucky that I have some very kind friends who are authors, because I was trying to figure out, like, do I stagger them all? What do I do? And I was talking to one of my author friends, and she was like, no. If you're going to release a series, release the whole thing within 90 days. Just drop them all at once. Have pre-order links for all four books the day that you put book one out there and just keep going like that. And so I've been relying a lot on their advice and we'll see, we'll see how many of these people who are picking up book one continue to book two, but at least book two, three and four will all be there. So. That's all. Yeah. 
that's a that's a way to do it. It it makes me want to like just like go away for like two or three years and write thirty five books, <laughs> however long I got to go away, and then come back and just throw them all at people <laughs> and be like, ah! and become the greatest author of all time. <laughs> just you know, prolific all at once. Yeah, that seems to be the way to do it now because it. I mean, there's so many out there, and obviously so many self-published authors as well. I mean, it's become so easy to, to publish your work, which is a great thing, because there's so many more voices out there in the mainstream that we can we can read. And I've read so many self-published books that are just fantastic stories, so many fantastic writers. But if you can, yeah, if you can do it to where you have a collection of stories, a collection of books, and put them out there at the same time, you up your chances of be, becoming... William Shakespeare by 6% at least. <laughs> that was just some quick math. I mean, quick. Hey, if you can do the math in your head, that's great. I can't. <laughs> cannot do math in my head. Yeah, I'm, so, yeah, it's going to be an experience. I'm excited for you. Are you, uh, are you writing anything else right now? Or are you just working on all this? I am working on, there was a novella series that I started that, there was horrible, horrible cover art on the first of them. So I kind of hid it. I, I hid the novella so that no one would see the cover art. I never talked about it. It took like a year for my agent to find out it existed. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I hate to mention it. And he told <laughs> how bad the cover art was till he saw it. And he was like, oh, wow. Can I, can I show you some cover art that I think is pretty good? You talk about bad cover art, it's keeping you from publishing. I, when I first wrote my book, uh, my first book, it was a novella. It's called Dead Heart, a uh, zombie knight's tale. And I didn't know anybody in the writing community. I didn't know any editors or cover artists or anything like that. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta publish this book. <laughs> I said, I gotta publish this freaking book, man. <laughs> so I went, I went about drawing my own cover and I used, <laughs> and this is the honest to God cover that is on the book on Amazon, okay? And I don't know if you can see that. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. That's colored pencil. That's that's Sir Aegeon. He's half zombie, half knight. Did he get stabbed in the heart? He did. He had his legs chopped off as well as you can see. Uh, oh no, that looks painful. It is, that's his friend Margaret there. Nice, nice. The castle, his horse, and the wit. There's a witch in the in the river. Her name's mm -hmm. Gravely. So this, <laughs> this <laughs> you want to talk about? I wish I could. I want. I don't know why I haven't won an award for worst cover art ever. But um, sometimes you just gotta <laughs> be be an idiot. I mean, that's my that's my style though. Yeah, you know, it's not yours. <laughs> I mean. You figure it out as you go, though. Yeah. But the publisher made the cover art for buying. It's bad. It's, oh, it's bad. I don't. I don't have a picture of it anywhere to show you. I was gonna say, man, I would love to it's see that. like awkward cartoon clip art that doesn't really work. It's, they just like stuck it together in a weird. Yeah. 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 So I'm gonna finish that series with. You different... gotta put that up. You gotta put that up on uh, Twitter or something. I want to see it. Okay, I will. Oh, you know what? You can email it to me, and I can, I can, and post that it. I can put it in the video. Okay, I will. Email <laughs> yes, that's but, awesome. I'm gonna rework that and okay. get that done, and then I need to work on finishing the third book in the Tale of Brian Adams series, and then I need to write another Maggie Trent book and so there's not all of the series I'm releasing this year are complete so there's gonna be can I ask about Brian Adams it's there's a T I'm just not good at saying my T so it's Brian Brian okay. yeah not I Brian saying, I, love, I love Brian Adams music yeah I realized after I named him and published the first book that you should not 
have a T on the end of a name if you don't say your T's very well because then no one's going to know what the name of your protagonist is. But right. too late for that one. But it's Brian. In your head it sounded good, right? Like, and in my head it sounded great. But then, you know, pronunciation, man, it's hard. It is. It is difficult. It's something we work on every day. Yep. That's exciting. So you, you've got multiple books. How? So this is your full time full time job then writing, correct? No, um, I'm actually an actor by trade. So I am, yeah, I am currently performing in Guys and Dolls, and so that's like my day job. Is where, are you, are you, where if you don't mind me asking, where are you located? In, are you you're in the United States, correct? Yeah, I'm. I mean, what? I. I work regionally, so I travel for shows a lot. So right now I'm in Southwest Florida, but like last year I was on the national tour of Wizard of Oz. So I was living on a bus. And then that I- That sounds so fun. I mean, in concept it is. <laughs> yeah, in reality, it blows. <laughs> you realize you're sleeping on a bus floor and like, this is your life choice that you made. You know, you start to doubt. Yeah, but then you get on stage and it's like, okay. Yeah, it's, I mean, we got to perform at some amazing theaters, like the Fox Theater in Detroit and, like, the Chicago Theater. So that's, it was definitely very cool. But there are some mornings when you wake up on the floor of the bus and you're like, I made choices that led me here. And I'm in a bag on a bus floor right now. That's great. That's, but, I mean, are you looking for this to lead to bigger roles and, or do you like theater? I mean, I I love theater. I'm actually, I'm one of the really lucky authors where I have no intention of quitting my day job entirely. Like, I'm not going to stop performing. I would like to be stable enough that I can be pickier about what shows I choose, that I can travel more, but I don't want to leave theater entirely. That's not something I can ever see myself doing. Yeah. And it's definitely gotten to the point where I I have to prioritize more of my time towards writing. So there are some theatrical things that I just can't fit in my schedule. It's just not going to happen. But right. I theater is like a, a way of life less than a job. And these are my people. And I don't want to leave that community. No, I can understand that. I'm trying to get into that community. <laughs> it's it's the strangest job you can ever have, but it's awesome. I know. I I imagine that it is. It's so how did you get into it? I've always done theater. I decided I wanted to be an actor when I was three. I that's what I I picked. I never wanted to be a princess or an astronaut. I just wanted to be an actor. Um <laughs> And then I went to college for dance, and I've been performing professionally. It's been my job since I left college. I'm really lucky to have been given theater work that consistently, so that's awesome. And, yeah, it's just always it's been what I do. Of, yes. Okay. Wow. That's my job. Talk and about I, life choices, right? I mean, you made, you obviously made the, the ones to get – I mean – learning how to dance and perform and since three years old having that idea i wanted to be jean-claude van damme when i was a kid i took karate hey that's beautiful <laughs> but yeah i i didn't want to get into theater because i wanted to like be in the spotlight i my mother took me to see arsenic and old lace which is not appropriate for a three-year-old at all it's about murdering people oh but the character that runs down the stairs screaming to Panama all the time, and I was not allowed to run down the stairs or yell in the house, and he was, and no one yelled at him for doing it. They clapped for him for doing it, so I wanted to do theater so I could break the rules and no one would yell at me. You were like, that's your hero, right? That's yeah. so <laughs> That's awesome. I'm on stage, and I'm going to run down the stairs, and you're going to have to clap for me, Mom. Was it ever a thought of being in front of other people performing? Did it ever give you the, like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? Did you ever get to, like, a stage fright kind of thing? Or was it always naturally just getting up there and doing the thing? I mean, it depends on what it is. There are definitely some roles or some things that I've been asked to do on stage where it's like, I don't know how this is going to go. But, yeah. 
you you for the most part get used to it there are always those occasional moments where you're like I don't have control of my surroundings I don't know if this is gonna be okay and that gets nerve-wracking but as for like just walking out there and doing what you've been trained to do not really because it's it's also rehearsed yeah you, you have two weeks of doing at least the company that I work most for, we have a two week rehearsal process to put up a whole show. So I've spent two weeks learning to do exactly what you want me to do on stage. So right. by then, there's been enough repetition that I should be able to repeat that exact process eight times a week. So right. It shouldn't be scary. Now, there are times when, you know, you get sure. thrown in as an understudy or you have a different dance partner for the day or there are like random things that happen and you're like, this is not what I was prepared to do today. Yeah. So, but it's, yeah, it's great. It's awesome. Super fun. That's amazing. Cause with writing, um, there's always that idea like you're behind, it's not even just, it's not even behind the cameras behind the, like you're way back in the back. That's why I started writing because I was, I wanted to get my stories out there, but I was too afraid to like, like doing YouTube and stuff like that. This is brand new for me, and it's it was terrifying at first, but I love it now. Um, like writing the stories was a way I could get it out there without anybody having to look at me and judge me necessarily. It was like the the least form of judgment. I could even put a pin name if I wanted to, that kind of thing. So, it was, but it was very freeing to be able to put that out there. Um, do you not ever, you don't have any fear of people being like, well, that's stupid. What she's doing is weird or. I mean, yes and no, less with writing than with performing. Yeah. Because with writing, it's like, I've had some people hate some things in my book. I have had someone accuse me of being transphobic in a review once. There was no transgender character in the book, so I don't don't know how that happened. But there's like a huge Maybe. rant about how like what a horrible human being I am. But whatever. Some people just have personal vendettas, right? It's like <laughs> there's nothing you can do about that. Maybe they were reading the wrong book, or they yeah. were hot. Because <laughs> where did you get that? But yeah. honestly, in theater, like when you're when you're criticized or insulted, it is so much more directed at you. Mm -hmm. So they're not saying, oh, this character was shallow and didn't have enough of an arc. They're saying, you're too fat. They're not saying like, "Yeah, I think that this feminist manifesto was like improperly done because the females weren't strong enough in the traditional sense. They're saying like, I hate your voice. So it's much more personal <laughs> when you're insulted in theater. And so yeah. writing to me is, it is much safer because you're not attacking me as like my human. You yeah. may not read my books, but you're not attacking me unless you're calling me transphobic. Right. How do you handle that kind of criticism as an actress, an actor? Honestly, I I went to a really, a very prestigious university that treats their students horribly. It was okay. basically four years from hell. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, they, like, weigh-ins, and if you didn't, if you weighed too much, like, they docked your grade. They would call you up in front of everyone to tell you how untalented you were. So after surviving four years of that, very little bothers me anymore. Yeah. Because it's like, what what are you going to say to me that hasn't been said before? Like, right. come at me, bro. There's nothing new. Like, <laughs> I don't care anymore. You can't break me at this point. But, yeah, it was, yeah, the, those four years, as much as I do not like the people at that university, uh, definitely gave me a thick skin. So it's really Thank hard to play. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, I, I can I can relate with that. My football coaches used to cuss me up and down nonstop, like just absolutely dog whip cuss me. And like now being yelled at, it's like <laughs> okay, whatever. 
whatever it's, it's really it's really lent to being able to do whatever you want like it's a having a personal freedom to be like well, whatever man like <laughs> whatever you say is not going to really bother it's like we, we truly embody the i'm rubber you're glue <laughs> whatever <laughs> whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you or you know whatever you write in your review i'll just pour myself a glass of wine and laugh <laughs> or you put it in a Word document and you edit out the parts you don't like and then you put that on your website. That's what I do. <laughs> That's amazing. Hey man, I don't know, look. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. My, my books are great, okay? <laughs> this is that's so awesome. I'm excited I'm so excited for your career in the self self publishing arena i'm really excited to see where uh, all these books go it sounds like you're already having amazing success with it not only with that but also your your life in theater and acting um so congratulations on all that stuff first of all because i don't know you i this is like our obviously our first meeting we haven't really communicated much on twitter um so congratulations seriously thank you you're welcome um <laughs> Heartfelt, heartfelt moment. Okay, I did want to um, just wrap it up a little bit because we're running short on time. I actually have to go to an interview. It's scary, but it'll be fun. And um, I wanted to ask you what you want your legacy to be when you are done with your career, when you retire and all is said and done and you've produced all the things. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I think... I would love my legacy to be as a storyteller because that embodies both of my careers, which is great. Um, but as a storyteller that brings joy and makes people just a little bit more human through their stories, whether that's, you know, asking people to look at in Girl of Glass what your obligation is to help those who are less fortunate in terrible times or if in the tethering series, it's looking at what love can really be or whatever the case may be. I hope that I can leave my readers just a little bit more human. Okay. Awesome. That's fair. I mean, yeah. Becoming, being more human is important, especially when technology is really kind of pushing us away from face-to-face -face interaction. Even though we have amazing technology like this that it, you know, allows face-to-face -face interaction, which is a fantastic thing. Yeah, we just, we, we drift away from, from the reality of what we would be if we had nothing left. And yeah. I think, you know, I'll, books can help bring us back to that. They, they help whittle us back down to the core of like what's, what's really important when push comes to shove. Yeah, I totally agree. Awesome, Megan. And any piece, any one piece of advice you would give the writing community that's really helped you? I would say find your own path that the it doesn't have to be indie, it doesn't have to be small press, it doesn't have to be trad, it doesn't have to be anything other than what you want it to be. And when you feel like you're going to fail, remember that the author community is actually a very loving place. So when you are desperate and cannot figure out what step to take, there are so many people who have been where you are, who are willing to give you advice, who are willing to help you who are willing to give you the resources for the next step. So don't don't ever feel like you have to go it completely alone, even though it's just you with your laptop. There are people out there who will say, release four books in 90 days. Honey, that's gonna be the best way to do it. There yeah. are gonna be people who will say, this press is closing, get out now. There are, there are always going to be people who will want to help you. So never be afraid to reach out for that help no matter which direction you're going in. Someone is there for you. They are there. You just have to find them. That's right. I have to be open to listen, right? Yep. That's and great advice. Yeah. Thanks. No, you did, you did awesome.
Megan O'Russell, thank you so much for joining me on the Uniweb interview show where all people become one people. It's truly a pleasure to have gotten to know you. Um, all your, your books are going to be out. One Girl of Glass is out now. And then in May, all four will be out. And then your tethering series is going to be coming out in August after that, correct? Uh, there's The Tale of Brian Adams is coming out yep. in June and July. June and July. That. So, but yeah, if you, my website is meganorussell.com and the Russell part has two S's and two L's. Uh, but there's yeah. schedules and news and everything up on there if you're looking for it or, you know, find me on Twitter. Everything's up there. I I will uh, tell you exactly what the rating is when it goes higher. It's going to be gonna, quiet. <laughs> That's it. That's for real. And I'm going to link everything in the description below the video. Um, thank you again so much for joining me. Don't be a stranger. And I'll talk to you later, okay? Thanks for having me. And good luck on your interview. I don't need luck. I got skills. <laughs> Yes, you do. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification for the bell. You know what? We love you. Love you. Love you. You know what?